and welcome. I'm uh, Ricardo Schiavo from Sustainable Bus, with my colleague Fabrizio Dalle Nogare. Hello. And this is the first event of the Sustainable Bus Tour 2021. Uh, for whom you may not know it, Sustainable Bus is a media uh, platform focused on innovation and uh, sustainability in uh, public uh, transport. We, we like to call it kind of a headlight on uh, future mobility. Uh, so just to give a little uh, background, the media was launched in uh, 2018, 2020 when uh, started with uh, the magazine that is out twice a year and the last edition was out just a few days ago and it is really available online. This year it was time to start with a tour of events in a digital uh, mode. And we must really be very thankful to those who are uh, attending. We got as many as over 1,400 registrations for this event from all over the world, and, uh, and this makes us very, very happy. The subject of today's event is charging and managing large e-bus fleets. Why such a topic? The answer is simple. As a rollout of the first large-scale battery electric bus fleets begin in Europe. The question is how to manage operation and charging processes becomes paramount. To date, indeed, many cities in Europe have launched small e-bus fleets in order to gain experience. 2021 and 2022 will see the uptake of large-scale deployment in many European cities. In such, a, in such a scenario, the issue the sector is facing is how to manage large e-bus fleets and which charging strategies or philosophies to adopt in order to allow efficient operation. And these are the topics we are going to talk about today. Yeah, thank you, Fabrizio. Yeah, we are talking about this topic with, uh, with a very ambitious goal. It is uh, not just focusing on today, not just focusing on uh, what has been done so far, but uh, uh, I mean, to uh, provide outlooks on how we see technology moving for the future, to provide uh, a view on future uh, scenarios. Uh, it is an ambitious goal, but we really think that the very high level uh, speakers we have with us today will make this uh, possible. So just to take a quick moment to introduce our speakers and the agenda of the, of the, of the event. The keynote presentation will be up to uh, Ruben Scriven, which is a senior analyst at the consulting company Interact Analysis. Then we will have an uh, operator session with uh, Tanguy Bouton, which is a group corporate fleet director at uh, Transdev Group, with uh, Bruno Laperi, which is director of the Center of Excellence Energy Transition Bus at Keoli uh, Group, and Michel Weber, which is project leader for the depot fleet implementation at BVG Berlin. And this will be followed by an industry session with uh, André Bourdet, which is Vice President Product Management and Strategy, as well as Head of E-Mobility Business at Itachi ABB Power Grids. Then we have uh, Alexander Schabert, Co-Founder and CCO of City, Valerio Vadacchino, uh, Head of Global Marketing ECT NL, uh, NLX, Mateusz Figarzewski, Director of E-Mobility De Development at uh, Solaris Bus and Coach, and uh, PSI Transco, which uh, will be represented by uh, two persons, Innovation Manager Michael Proisker and the Head of Development Martin uh, Frenzel. Uh, wrap up and conclusions finally will be up to Aida Abdullah, Senior Manager Knowledge and Innovation at uh, UTP, the International Organization of uh, Public Trust, that we are very, very glad to have on board with us uh, today. So Ricardo, it's time to start. Ruben will give us a big picture about which are the market trends regarding e buses and mainly charging strategies in Europe. I have the, the huge pleasure of saying that we, are talk, that we are talking in front of more than 700 people. So please, Ruben, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Great, thank you very much, everyone. Um, good afternoon. My uh, name is Ruben Scriven. I'm the lead analyst at uh, Interact Analysis covering um, global commercial vehicles, in particular focusing on uh, electric commercial vehicles. Uh, I've been with Interact Analysis now for more than three years, uh, and I helped build up our electric commercial vehicle research practice here. So during this discussion, we're going to be going through uh, some of the European electric bus market trends, uh, along with our projected forecasts, some of the dynamics between depot and opportunity charging, and then finally taking a look at the bigger picture in terms of the global electric bus market. 
Uh, before we get started, though, I just wanted to give a quick uh, uh, introduction to Interact Analysis. Um, so we are a boutique research firm focusing on uh, the global commercial vehicle market. So this includes buses, trucks, off-highway equipment, and in particular, the trend towards electrification uh, for these vehicles. As a company, we have a very strong focus on primary research. So we typically have between 50 and 100 research interviews for every report. Uh, so it's likely that I've spoken with many of you listening uh, during this event at some point or another to discuss the market. Um, as you can see, we work with most of the uh, sort of major global commercial vehicle suppliers worldwide, uh, along with several OEMs and uh, suppliers providing data on global commercial vehicle uh, electrification. I wanted to start with um, this slide. So before we jump into the European electric bus market, I wanted to share this slide. Um, I think it's interesting to see that whilst the European market is growing at a phenomenal rate, uh, the market in Asia really accounts for the lion's share. Um, and it's important to take into account the wider electric bus ecosystem if we're to draw conclusions about the European market. Uh, however, we'll discuss uh, the reasons for these regional differences towards the end of uh, this presentation. The European electric bus market is forecast to grow from 2,114 units registered in 2020 to more than 12,760 units in 2030. Of these 12,760 units, 30% are forecast to be intercity buses. Looking specifically at the city bus portion, we forecast that in 2030, just under 9,000 electric buses will be registered annually, representing just over 40% of the market. A further 20% uh, of the market is forecast to be either hybrids or fuel cell buses, and the remaining 40% will be non-electrified, with a large percentage being uh, natural gas. In uh, 2020, 4% or 44% of electric buses registered used an e-axle or an electric portal axle, whereas the other remaining 56% used a central driveline architecture. Interestingly, while we see uh, you know, a growing trend towards e-axles e and, and electric portal axles um, so far, we're actually forecasting a growing share of central drives in the short to midterm as MAN, Scania and Volvo ramp up their production. So in 2025, we're forecasting that uh, electric portal axles will actually only account for 30% of units registered, but long term when we go out to 2030, this will account for over 50% of electric buses registered. And interestingly, more than 89% of electric buses registered in 2020 had system voltage levels above 500 volts. Uh, there were very few models in the market which uh, used 400 volt architectures. Now, in terms of the countries with the highest penetration rate, so the number of new vehicles registered which were electric relative to the total number of uh, uh, buses registered, um, the Netherlands actually was overtaken by Sweden in 2020, but we forecast that Norway will have the highest penetration in 2030. However, whilst Norway is forecast to have the highest penetration of electric city buses in 2030, we expect that Norway will account for just 4% of the European electric city bus market that year. France, the UK and Germany are forecast to have the three largest markets, representing just over or just under 50% of the total European bus market, electric bus market in that year. Now, this is so, uh, showing a slightly older slide from one of our reports published in 2019, but it highlights an interesting observation that we further explored in recent years. Um, I wanted to caveat quickly that when we talk about depot charging and opportunity charging, we're referring more to the location and not the power. Um, most opportunity charging still uses high power, but we are seeing more high power charging in the depots as well. Uh, so in the top left hand side, you can see that depot charging accounts for a, this fairly small share of electric buses registered in Europe up to 2017. This was largely due to the fact that many of the electric bus batteries didn't have the energy density or the capacity to handle a full operations day uh, without needing an opportunity charge. Um, now I have to preface that this data is from 2019. However, we're we do hear this trend continuing anecdotally. Um, during our research discussions with OEMs, we hear that a lot of tenders now require at least a uh, 200 kilowatt hour uh, operating capacity throughout the lifetime of the vehicle. So many OEMs provide vehicles with at least 300 kilowatt hours uh, to account for the battery degradation. Now, why do we see this trend towards de uh, opportunity uh, depot charging in the short term? One of the main reasons we're seeing this trend uh, towards depot charging is the fact that the cost of batteries are decreasing significantly over the past 10 years. And this is forecast to continue, as you can see from this chart. 
This data comes from our recently published electric commercial vehicle pricing study, uh, where we interviewed OEMs and suppliers to understand trends in electric component pricing. With the decline in the cost of batteries, along with the higher energy densities, uh, we've seen a shift towards depot charging, um, and in particular overnight charging. Furthermore, we've heard from op uh, operators that opportunity charging in public locations can often be an administrative, uh, an administrative hassle, which has further incentivized operators to bring the charging back to the depots. I think the most important factor, however, is that electric buses are a new technology, and many operators will favor a one-to-one -one replacement with diesel buses. This avoids any significant adjustments to the transport network. But I guess the real question is, is this trend sustainable? Whilst there has been a short-term trend towards overnight depot charging, uh, based on the reasons I've discussed on this slide, uh, we do expect there to be a bigger balance between opportunity and depot charging, and especially a mix between low and high power charging. Up until about 2017, we were in the first phase of market development, where cities across Europe were trialing a small number of electric buses. Since then, we've entered phase two, which is characterized by a large scale rollout of electric buses. However, whilst the large scale of, uh, whilst many of the new buses registered each year are electric, uh, the vast majority of the fleets still remain diesel, at least for the short to midterm. If you look at Transport for London's fleet audit, for example, in, in March 2020, just 3.4% of their fleet was battery electric, uh, which really highlights the fact that many of these fleets are still optimized or um, uh, designed for diesel operation. Once a threshold number of electric buses have been introduced into transport networks, however, we'll start to enter phase three, which is looking at how to optimize transport networks to leverage the benefits of electric buses. This will require a more flexible approach to charging, balancing distributed power networks across the city. And it should be noted that some cities around Europe have already entered phase three. Now, these um, assumptions have been baked into our battery capacity forecast. So this graph shows the battery capacity ranges for electric city buses uh, registered across Europe to 2030. As you can see, the share of smaller batteries with less than 200 kilowatt hours are forecast to increase from roughly about 13% in 2020 to just under 30% in 2030, which is driven primarily by the growth in opportunity to charge buses, which have a smaller battery size. Now, returning to the graph I presented at the beginning, I wanted to finish up by returning uh, to the global ecosystem. So how does Europe fit into the global market? Whilst the focus of this presentation has been in the European electric city bus market, as I mentioned before, Europe plays a fairly small part in the global electric bus market. Asia, for example, accounts for just under 85% of the global demand for electric buses between 2020 and 2030. One of the main reasons for this is just because APAC purchases more buses in general each year. Uh, APAC accounts for roughly about 75% of total city bus registrations each year, irrespective of the powertrain architecture. However, several Asian markets have prioritized uh, electric buses as a strategic incentive. So China is the, uh, the ex uh, obvious example. Um, uh, Deng Xiaoping, who uh, led China's market reform in the, uh, in the 80s, actually once said that the Middle East has oil, but China has rare earth metals. Uh, it's no surprise, therefore, that China has prioritized the uptake of electric vehicles and buses in particular, uh, which has kickstarted the global shift towards the electrification of public transport. Uh, whilst China's bus registrations have been decreasing in recent years due to subsidy reductions, uh, we're forecasting that in 2030, China will register just under 80,000 electric city buses which is on par with the number of city buses it registered in 2017. India is another great example. Uh, India's economy is very much tied to the price of oil. Uh, and since it doesn't have much domestic uh, uh, production, um, it really does rely on the oil price. One of President Modi's uh, major policies has been the famous two incentive scheme, uh, which looks to promote the uptake of electric vehicles. Given um, uh, the amount of oil which buses displace relative to uh, passenger cars and two, uh, three and two wheelers, uh, India has really prioritized the uptake of electric buses. And whilst there have been some teething problems with the rollout of electric buses in India, uh, as you can read in our guest article we wrote for Sustainable Buses latest magazine, uh, we do forecast that um, India will be the second largest market for electric buses globally in 2030. Um, in 2030, we forecast that India will register just under 20,000 electric city buses, corresponding to about 24% of the total market for city buses in India that year. So to conclude, whilst the European electric city bus market is forecast to grow significantly over the 10 years, uh, counting for about 40% of the total European city bus market in 2030, Europe itself will only account for a fairly small chunk of the global electric city bus market, 
which is concentrated in APAC. During the past three years, we've seen a shift towards depot charging due to the lower uh, price of batteries and the higher densities, and also the um, uh, uh, propensity for a one-to-one -one replacement with diesel buses. Um, however, when we do enter the third phase of market development, which will see the optimization of transport networks in favor of electric buses, uh, we'll likely see a mixture between opportunities in depot charging and in particular around high and low power charging, which I'm sure we'll discuss more in the sessions to come. Um, so this concludes the opening presentation. For anyone wanting to discuss uh, the market in more detail and learn more about our research into the electrification of commercial vehicles, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or email info at interactanalysis.com. Thank you very much. And in particular, thank you to Ricardo for, for organizing such a great event and the rest of his team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rume, for the very informative over, uh, overview. So a picture of a market which is, uh, which is growing where I mean, depot-based solutions are facing a, a, growing, a growing demand. With the, with the clarification, depot-based solution, we, it doesn't just mean plug-in charging, but also I mean, pantry of solution inside the depot, okay? And Ruben stressed also um, an important topic that the transition when, uh, when scaling up uh, is not just a change of vehicles, but a change in the approach, in the managing of the fleets, which need uh, a careful optimization. So these are absolutely topics that will be broadly discussed uh, uh, today. So let's go straight to the uh, operator session, starting with uh, Transdev, uh, Tangui Bouton. So Transdev has been a pioneer in Europe in, uh, in the field of e-bus deployment with the 100 uh, uh, vehicles launched in the Netherlands in a row in 2018. So may you outline uh, the learnings from that and from the other deployments and uh, maybe if you have uh, seen a change in the approach to e-bus operation uh, from the point of view of uh, charging. So please, uh, thank you. Sure, thanks Ricardo. Um, so I would like to uh, take the opportunity to introduce uh, the Zero Emission team, uh, which is a dedicated team uh, for Transdev uh, uh, worldwide to uh, share the best practices around uh, zero emission vehicles. Um, and if you look at the right hand bottom, uh, the bottom right hand corner of this uh, slide, you will see a QR code that uh, will uh, direct you towards a video that explains uh, more in details uh, what is the zero emission team. But uh, just to, uh, to start, um, well, uh, I have to, to say that uh, first of all, Transdev commits to a cleaner and more sustainable public transport path. And we have uh, several pillars to support this uh, transition. Um, so the zero emission team, which is a dedicated team of experts uh, on around zero emission and uh, whose uh, aim is to reach the goal fixed by the moving green uh, environmental strategy. Um, we share all the findings and, uh, and uh, return on experience around our operations, implementations uh, within the living lab which is a yearly uh, event that brings uh, transit authorities, experts and operators to talk about their projects, ambitions and share learnings and best practices. So just to have a, a little look on, on uh, in the mirror, um, if you see the, uh, on this slide, uh, the share of electric vehicles within our fleet really expanded uh, in the past years. Uh, we were committed two years ago to have uh, 1,005 uh, 100 uh, uh, vehicles, uh, electric vehicles in operation by 2024. But in fact, we will have a uh, uh, rich and uh, overpassed uh, this threshold by the end of this year. Uh, so here you have uh, an insight about our main references in terms of uh, electric vehicle, uh, large scale electric vehicle operations. So as you can see, uh, we have the 145 electric vehicles in operation in Sweden, uh, 211 in the Netherlands and uh, in the Amsterdam region, actually for the Schiphol airport and its uh, region. Um, another batch of uh, plus than 100 uh, electric vehicles will be in operation uh, by the end of the year and uh, by the end of next year in Eindhoven. And we also recently uh, got awarded a contract in the Colombia uh, for more than 400 electric buses, which are all uh, overnight charging. So our path is to accelerate uh, the transition towards zero emission transportation. 
And uh, every time we need to adapt our strategy to the uh, local specifications. So as you can see on this slide, um, in fact, uh, the charging strategy is uh, really depending on the operational needs. For instance, in the Netherlands at, uh, at the Amsterdam region, uh, we are charging uh, with pantographs, but uh, that's because uh, the vehicles are each running around 100,000 kilometers a year. Uh, in Valence, in uh, the south of France, the vehicles uh, we are currently operating are running around 50,000 kilometers a year. So this enables to have only plug depot charging. And in Göteborg, we use both technologies because the, the, the mileage covered per, per each vehicle per year is of uh, 72,000 vehicles, uh, 72,000 kilometers, sorry. So every time we need to uh, determine what is the best strategy of charging according to the operational needs. Um, we cannot, for instance, uh, hope to run 100,000 kilometers a year with uh, only uh, slow plug charging vehicles at the depot. Otherwise, we would need much more vehicles uh, than with opportunity charging on the routes and or at the depot. Uh, just to have another focus on the, the, the sources of energy we use, uh, for uh, electric vehicles, because uh, from an environmental perspective, low carbon electricity should be favored uh, to make zero emission uh, uh, vehicle relevant. So in uh, Canada, in Quebec province, we use 100% hydropower electricity. In Australia, uh, we uh, recently uh, operated our first electric bus with 100% electricity from solar panels, which are installed on the roof of uh, the depot, meaning 0% uh, grid electricity. And in Valence, so in south of France, uh, we operate the vehicles uh, thanks to uh, an e electricity coming from the grid, but with 100% uh, renewable energy through green certificates. So one of the key learnings from our uh, large scale e-bus operations is uh, on the, on the on the first side, regarding the maintenance, as you can see, uh, usually in the diesel or thermal world, uh, two thirds of the maintenance uh, were done uh, regarding uh, components uh, replacements and one third diagnosis. Now uh, we can see that only uh, uh, with electric buses, we need much more diagnosis and a problem solving issue related to softwares and uh, related to, to IT and data. And only one third of the operations is dedicated to components replacements. Another learning, which is quite uh, uh, interesting and which has a huge impact on our uh, current operations is that uh, there are uh, evolutions regarding uh, standards. And for instance, as you can see uh, on the on the screen here, we have vehicles from Eindhoven, uh, which was implemented in 2016. And uh, on the, the white vehicles are from Amsterdam. The difference between those uh, vehicles is that on the one hand at Eindhoven, there was no standard for the pantograph implementation on the roof of the vehicle. So it was located between the two axles. And on the other hand at AML, you can see that the pantograph is on top of the front axle, which is a new standard uh, that has been uh, published uh, also with UITP uh, to make sure uh, of uh, vehicle and charger interoperability. Uh, meaning that uh, we are now facing the next phases of uh, Eindhoven uh, electric bus implementations. And uh, the new vehicles to be delivered on this side will be equipped with pantograph on top of the front axle. So that's a real challenge to, uh, to mix, let's say, uh, older and uh, more recent generation of vehicles according to new standards, uh, especially when we talk about interoperability. And one of uh, the, the, the third uh, topic I would like to highlight here is uh, the fact that we have uh, new players uh, with electric vehicles in our uh, PTO business or activity. Um, we have batteries and we have chargers. 
um, each of them generate data. And we saw that in the first deployment, we took a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, risk management in the deployment of the infrastructure and of uh, the, the, the vehicles and the, the new ecosystem. And uh, in fact, a lot of uh, um, the, 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 a lot of infrastructure was oversight. So now we're in the phase where we are uh, um, collecting data from the battery, from the bus, from the charger to optimize uh, each uh, new uh, deployment because we want to avoid oversizing because of course it is costly and uh, also because it enables to have uh, a better TCO and uh, a better operation at the end. So as a conclusion, I would say that the transformation of Transdev bus and coach fleet is an ongoing process and our alternative fuel fleet, including zero emission is growing. The battery electric buses account for the majority of today's needs. Uh, indeed, they cover more than 80% of the uh, urban needs. Uh, given the daily mileage and the operational span. But uh, for the future, we see that hydrogen powered vehicles seems to be very promising solutions. And uh, we invite you uh, cordially to join uh, the webinar session that will be held uh, in October. And as a speaker from Transdev with Bart Kreivanger, who is the zero emission program man manager in the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanguy, also for mentioning our next event, which will be held next October. And as you mentioned, will be focused on the role that fuel cell buses may play in the future public transport networks. Thank you once again. So now let's shift to Keoli and Bruno Leperi. So last year, Keoli has been protagonist of the largest single delivery performance so far in Europe with 246 battery electric buses launched in the, in the Netherlands. So starting from these, may you introduce the company's activities and outline how have you planned the network operations? So in other words, which are the main challenges an operator faces today when it comes to deploy large fleets of battery electric buses? And they are a lot. Thank you, Ricardo, to give me the opportunity to share the knowledge of the Keolis group in such an event, I will share my screen. Oh, excuse me, Tango, you, I think you should stop the sh uh, screen sharing. Just let me know if is that switch properly or not. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, it's good for you? Yep. Thank you, yeah. Uh, just a few words uh, for, for the general context. Uh, Keolis is a multimodal uh, transport operator with, with train, tramway, uh, metro, and a bit more than 23,000 buses uh, operated in more than 16 countries. And we are, uh, we, we are the partner of more than 300 PTAs uh, in those countries. Uh, sustainability. Uh, in the services we deliver is in, is in the core of our corporate purpose. Uh, and nowadays about 20% uh, of our 23,000 fleet of buses and coaches are run with the uh, alternative energies to diesel. Among those, we have now more than 800 uh, electric buses and battery. And the last uh, network we signed last week is, was in Sweden, in Gothenburg with 60 more. Uh, I would like to focus on two, two major networks we started in December last year, uh, Bergen in Norway and Eiselvert uh, in the Netherlands. And these are a good example of uh, this market change we all feel uh, in Europe today, especially in Northern Europe, uh, to go toward electric uh, mobility. Bergen uh, is a large fleet of more than 100 vehicles, uh, uh, 255 bus drivers, and we, we managed a very quick mobilization uh, during uh, last year, starting in December last year, 
it was very successful. There is a, a large satisfaction, both from PTA, PTO as, and, and the passengers, of course. And uh, as a figure, we can have in mind that uh, we reduced uh, the, the CO2 emission compared to diesel by 85%. Eiselvert, as you said, Ricardo is uh, the largest fleet uh, so far uh, for electric buses in Europe with 246 vehicles, uh, seven depots, more than 750 drivers. Uh, and as you said, it was quite a challenge. It is still a challenge to mobilize, to start such an operation. It started in December 13, last year, to start such an operation. And, and to operate it. Um, uh, the, we have more than 180 chargers, both opportunity and depot charging. It is a complex uh, project at a large scale. Uh, and I have to say with very few time for mobilization uh, because of COVID crisis, and I will come back to this. I would like to share with you some lessons learned uh, on Eiselvert, uh, this iconic network we are operating now, now for, we've been operating for five months now. Uh, the first one uh, uh, is uh, that one of the criteria to, to, to select a bus manufacturer is the capacity to deliver on time. And when we talk about very large scale fleets, it's really important uh, to have a partner who is able to deliver on time. Uh, we find this partner and uh, the buses were delivered in October and the, op the operation started uh, mid-December and we had very few time because of the crisis to, uh, to prepare the mobilization. Uh, second key point, uh, this is a kind of message I would like to, to deliver to the PTAs. Uh, a project like uh, Eiselvert is a capex of 140 million euro, 100% uh, supported by, by Keolis, uh, private sector. And uh, this huge capital uh, intensity uh, means for a private op operator, a very high residual value risk at the end of the contract for all the assets. And uh, to keep this industry uh, sustainable, we will probably have to find shared sch new schemes to, to mitigate both with the PTA side, the PTO side, uh, to mitigate this risk of residual value at the end of the contract. Uh, otherwise, probably one day this industry will not be any more sustainable for the private sector. This is, I don't want to be dramatic, but this is the kind of message I would like to deliver. Third point, uh, and probably the more important one. Uh, the, the biggest lessons learned is that e-bus is a system. And uh, I used to say an electric bus uh, without is uh, of course charging infrastructure, but as well IT is nothing almost like a tramway without rail and catenary. Uh, and we have to think about the system as a whole. And this is a difficulty. We have the vehicles, the chargers, and the IT system, which is the infrastructure of it. And uh, we have to develop uh, a, a job which is quite new for the bus industry, which is a system integrator. And uh, frankly speaking, we had a bit lack of system integration and mostly uh, a lack of time to integrate the system in Eiselvert as a very large scale. And we have had many challenges, challenges in operation because of that. Fourth point, as I said, IT is strategic. Uh, we have the charging management system, the depot management system, the supervision system, the planning system, and you can interact with the maintenance uh, monitoring system. And uh, it's really uh, strategic to have the system integrated and operational when you start the operation. Otherwise, you might, uh, be, be, uh, you might be forced to start the operation without eyes and ears almost. Uh, and most of the time we have uh, underestimated this time uh, which is necessary 
to design the system and to integrate it. Uh, and uh, because of, of this lack of time in Eiselwert, uh, we have had to uh, engage extra staff and extra, extra cost, of course, staff and cost to adapt uh, this uh, exceptional situation uh, so far. And as a kind of conclusion, but uh, um, I could say that uh, in real life, and I mean uh, a project like Eisenwert is really real life uh, as, a, as a large scale, uh, the, the reduction of flexibility we know because of the electric system, huh? we have buses, chargers, IT uh, with, a, uh, with a, a very less uh, flexibility than operating diesel systems. Uh, the consequence of this reduction is that we ask for much more flexibility for the operators. And when I talk about operators, uh, I mean drivers, supervisors, uh, um, control, uh, control uh, operators. And this is not only a change of technology, this is really a, a complete uh, change management uh, in the network and in the company. With, with a lot of consequences, both on the systems, the technical side, maintenance operation, uh, training of the drivers and so on. It was a huge advantage and uh, thanks to the exceptional adaptation of our teams, uh, we are on the good way to, to implement it. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you also for sharing your, the lesson you have learned. So far. Now let's move to Berlin and to Michel, we Michel Weber, because BWG here represents the publicly owned transport company. Uh, and what is more, BWG is a German operator with, with more e buses in its fleet. So I would like to ask Mr. Weber which are the company strategies on e bus transition and which experience have you had so far? Please. Good afternoon and hello from cloudy Berlin in Germany. Yes, um, I'm the project manager for our early development eBus fleet, and I'm glad to give you a short overview about our eBus strategy in Berlin. Now, our path to the future is global climate protection as well as local air pollution control. And this comes together with the goal to have a totally locally emission-free bus fleet in the year of 2030, meaning no more diesel buses in operation. And we see different technologies to come to that point. Um, depot charging and, op and opportunity charging will have, uh, a, we will have a large fleet of that and there will be kind of a race between these two technologies. But we also know that there will no one fits all solution for Berlin. And there also doesn't have to be one solution because we have a very large bus fleet. And this means that we will also have a niche for battery trolley hybrid as a new implementation for some bus roads that have uh, over 20,000 passengers a day. But we are also focusing on H2 fuel cells. But for now, at the moment, we could not create an uh, economical uh, use case uh, for that. So we are still watching about this technology. Our eBus ramp up, the early electrification of Berlin is a phase from 2019 to 2022, where we will electrify 15% of our eBus fleet or of our uh, bus fleet will then be electric. And now we're standing at this point, 2021 with 138 electric buses. And this eBus ramp up for us is for getting experiences. Experiences of, uh, of the conversion of a, of a depot. 
with a large bus fleet. So 128 buses is one third of one bus tempo for us. We want to get uh, experiences about the real energy consumption, uh, optimizing and operations, and of course, also having our first winter through eBus operation, our first heavy winter. And then between 2022 and 2030, we will electrify the rest 85% of our eBus fleet. And how does this work from 2022 to 2030? You see that here. How many e-buses we plan to have in our fleet in every year? And you also see there are some mile steps. That means new infrastructure has to be uh, put in place. In every year, we will build infrastructure to reach the goal in 2030. And you also see two path to 2030. That's because uh, we all don't know how um, the batteries are development uh, are developing. And so we have two scenarios, one rather optimistic scenario, or as we call it, opportunity focused scenario, which means that we'll have in 2030 about 2,680 buses in our fleet. And the more risk minimizing scenario would mean that we have more buses in our fleet to solve the same timetable because the technology is not uh, that well. And so in 2030, we will end uh, with this fleet. But now at the moment, 137 buses is still the largest uh, e-bus fleet in Germany. Until 2030, it won't be boring for us. We uh, have put together some challenges to 2030. Uh, I will not go to all of them, but uh, some only battery range and choosing the right technology. Uh, I already told you we don't know exactly uh, in which year the battery will have what uh, capacities or what costs. And it is uh, difficult to choose the right technology. Uh, we know working technologies, but to choose the perfect technology, the cost minimizing technology, that is challenging. Especially challenging is also infrastructure in our depots. We have six uh, already existing depots that we have to upgrade and we will build two to three new depots. And upgrading existing depots, that sounds nice, but you have to know some of our depots are so old that they stand under monument protection. And that doesn't make it easy to put uh, electric bus infrastructure on them. A third one is the electrification of big vehicles in Berlin. Uh, some of you know our double-deckers. Our three axle low floor double decker. And that is still impossible for us to build such a vehicle in a electric uh, or hydrogen version at the moment, at least. And by all the electrification of our bus fleet, we still have the last point, increasing of our tra public transport demand. So we, by the way, we also need more buses to move more passengers through our city. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Michel. Uh, until 2030, it won't be boring. And of course, we, we, are, we are happy about this. We're very happy. So let's go straight to the second round of the operator session. And we, we would like to tell you that uh, we have a huge audience. We are uh, a little more than 930 people, so thank you all. Uh, back to Transdev, Mr. Uh, Tangi Bouton. When we face new technologies, we, fa we face very fast moving and innovative markets. So focusing on the electric bus market and given your group's experience, the question is how to deal with choices that must be taken today, but will have repercussions on a future 
where technologies will certainly have moved have moved ahead. Uh, it's a very good question, and actually, uh, it's uh, one of the stake of uh, uh, electric bus deployment today. As you saw earlier in my presentation, uh, the, the, the evolution of the pantograph, for instance, if we uh, only talk about hardware, uh, position on the roof of the bus is already a huge challenge uh, when you talk about uh, then implementing uh, new phases with new uh, vehicles on the same depot. Uh, regarding uh, software, the, the stake, uh, as far as I, I, I know, is uh, to be the more open as possible, uh, to be able to uh, evaluate with the uh, new standards coming in. But one of uh, the main, uh, let's say, uh, finding for us is to make sure that the new versions of uh, vehicles and chargers and batteries will be able to communicate with the old versions of uh, vehicle, battery, and chargers. So to ensure interoperability uh, between the standards evolution is for us the key uh, question when it comes to uh, software and data evolution. Ah, thank you, thank you, Tango. I yeah, mentioned the interoperability, which is uh, absolutely a key point that will be discussed again, and also uh, Aida Abdullah in the, in the end will uh, outline about uh, what the projects addressed uh, at the topic of uh, standardization and uh, interoperability. So, uh, Bruno, Keoli, um, your group has developed a significant experience on uh, uh, the EBRT uh, side in France and the, in the Basque count. So BRT systems, uh, we know, have never enjoyed much uh, uh, popularity in, uh, in Europe so far. But leveraging on uh, electric uh, drive trains, uh, uh, which scenarios, which outlooks uh, do you see for this kind of applications? Please. Yeah, thank you, Ricardo. Uh, th this is a real wind of change, in fact. This is what, what we believe uh, in Keolis uh, with this EBRTs. Uh, we have started, uh, in fact, three, three brand, brand new networks uh, in 2019 uh, with EBRT in France. One of them was uh, not exactly electric, it was hydrogen one, but it is still electric, as you know, hydrogen in Po. The two others were in, in Amiens, north of France, and in Bayonne, uh, by, by the ocean in the southwest. Um, just remember, what is a, BR, a BRT? The BRT, it's a, a strong structural line with a high quality of infrastructure, most of the time, at least partially dedicated. A traffic priority system and a dedicated fleet with a strong identity. And we consider that a EBRT is a system and it has to be designed and operated as a system. And uh, a system, and this is what I, I, I said just before, uh, this is the main characteristic of an electric bus uh, network. That's why uh, EBRT, uh, the, the concept for BRT is potentially very interesting for, for e-buses. Uh, e uh, when we add to this that as a capex uh, compared to uh, what we know for a tramway of uh, 20 or 30 million euro per kilometer, it can be much, much, much lower for EBRTs. Uh, regarding the capacity, uh, we are really approaching uh, the capacity of a tram with uh, uh, more than 17,000 PPHD, PPHPD, sorry. sorry. And the, C, the C3 line in Lyon, for example, has a capacity of uh, more than 55,000 55, passengers per day. Uh, so you have, you are very close to the tramway in operation in capacity, much less expensive, uh, and even a bit more flexibility uh, than with the tramway in operation because you, vehicles can overtake, for example, that you cannot really do for tramway. If you add to this, uh, this really futuristic shapes, uh, brand new vehicles uh, look like a looking like a tram uh, we have known in uh, uh, Amiens and Bayonne and Po as well, uh, without without head of a line, uh, this is a real success. I mean, in Amiens there is a, a large level of satisfaction, both for PTA, PTO, and passengers, and it is 
such a, a big success that we have, uh, uh, this is confirmed because we have launched uh, last week, this is a brand new, uh, brand new, we have uh, launched uh, last week the second line of the party in Bayonne. Uh, and uh, I don't see any reason to why, why it wouldn't develop uh, wider in Europe. Okay, thank you, thank you, Bruno. Yeah, you mentioned EBRT could be really something that uh, can, could help improving also the image of uh, bus uh, transport, thanks to the design, thanks to the, the highest commercial speed. I, as I said, as I said, it's a real, a real wind of change in this industry, a real one. Yeah. Well, well. So let's move back again in uh, in Berlin with uh, Michel Weber. So moving to new technologies, uh, um, we have already said it requires a careful planning and. Uh, in your case, in the case of a public transport company owned by uh, by the public, also a close dialogue with the, with the city, and of course, it requires uh, quite a lot of money. You mentioned the target of 1,830 uh, e-buses by 2030. So, Michel, may you outline how BBG is getting ready to this challenge as a company, and give us an indication of which are the funding methods put in place uh, so far to enable the transition, please. Yes, I showed you already uh, what we plan to do. And now, how was this plan created? So the first step was that the city government set up a law with the goal of 2030. And we, as BBG, we are a city-owned enterprise. So that means for us, let's do. And the roles in this game are, we are the operators, we are the experts, we plan, we buy buses and so on. And uh, the state should give us the money, no matter what it costs, because there is no plan B in that law. Sounds nice, but actually that doesn't work because of uh, federal budget laws. So we do need to set up a good forecast for our budget needs. So in which year do we need how much money? until 2030, 2045, or uh, even later. And uh, the city controls us or shakes us and says, oh, that could also be cheaper. That leads to a discussion about uh, premises, about all these um, forecasts. And as you already saw, we set up two scenarios because <laughs> We couldn't put it uh, just into one. And all the experiences until that point, even with two scenarios, are written down in our current traffic contract. Um, still saying we get all the money, uh, all, the, all the extra costs due to electric operation uh, that would not be there uh, if you only would operate a diesel fleet which means for our customers, there will be no higher ticket prices. And uh, the funding for the electrification of buses in Berlin will be step-by-step. Step. So uh, in each year, the findings for the next few years will be discussed, which also means that uh, now at the moment, we don't have 2 million euros of budget for all the electrification until the year 2030. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Michel. So, Fabrizio, before you mentioned also the, the fact that it has been told that, uh, I mean, it will be not boring until 2030. Now we have heard, uh, I mean, there's no plan B. Okay, so um, it seems really that the road is, uh, is paved up to uh, 2030. We know, for instance, that the EU Clean Vehicle Directive has a uh, calls for 22.5% of zero emission buses of the new tenders uh, for the next five years. And then the person, the, the share will increase uh, uh, again. And, and we also know the funding from the recovery fund will also be focusing also on the transition of public transport to fossil free uh, operations. So thank you very much to Keoli, to Transdev, which are also uh, mobility partners of the Sustainable Bus Tour 2021. Thank you to Bibuji Berlin for being able to, I mean, sharing uh, what are they doing and what they will gonna do with regards to bus electrification. So let's jump on the other side. So 
and uh, um, focus on the solutions and, and the vision that industry players have in, uh, in store today for the e-bus market. So I would start with uh, Itachi, Itachi ABB Power Grid. We have here Andre uh, Bourdet. So last year, your group launched the grid emotion system, which is addressed at the uh, at depot charging. And it looks like we have seen in the, in the introduction that we are witnessing a growing demand for this, this kind of solution, depot-based charging solution in Europe. So do you think the trend uh, will be confirmed in the future? Because uh, I mean, in Itachi's ABB Power Grid's portfolio, uh, there's also a system that was uh, formerly known as the TOSA and gained much, much attention in the bus uh, uh, sector. Please, uh, Andre. Thank you for having me this afternoon and, and, and uh, salutation to everyone. So the question is, is very relevant. First is, I would say at Itachi BB Power Grid, obviously we have like the last 10 years of experience in the mobility sector for public transportation with our flash technology. And we have learned uh, quite a lot in this. Uh, in this. So what we have um, re realized is the following. Until recently, most of the market has been focused on small scale pilots. Operators felt that things will come at, let's say at scale, but not yet. So they were more trying to understand how do I operate a bus uh, based on you know, battery electric bus and then the question was really around, I buy a couple of chargers, I buy a couple of, of bus, and I try in a line on the operation to understand what, what it changed to me. And we have just seen in the previous session, uh, we had a great deal of learnings. Now, the question going forward, it will be different. Instead of having a couple of buses or a couple of chargers, the question now will be like, and we've seen, for instance, with BVG as a, the last speaker, we're going to move towards not like five, 10, but like a thousand buses. And in all location within the city, we will have to make sure that we can charge them at any time to fulfill the timetable we have, to fulfill the work, the, the workforce we have on the drivers, and also that we have to consider this uh, as a system as we have also talked about it. So now suddenly we enter into a new area or new era where the, Charging infrastructure itself is not anymore a question of having a couple of charger, it's a question of how do I couple my operation from my mobility fleet together with the grid and the power that I can get from the grid. And, and therefore, the you know, just to give an order of magnitude, we project that in by 2030 we're going to have a hundred million vehicles in our roads. A hundred million of vehicles in our road in the world means 500 um terawatt hour of electricity consumption this is what france as a country consumes on a yearly basis so you have a very strong energy mobility nexus that is created and then if we go back then to the to the, the, the question on the depot for operator the question will then be how do i connect to the grid like how do i have the grid to plug solution uh, as opposed to a charger so you you kind of enlarging the question into the electrical integration and then the second question will be, how do I manage in the most efficient way this energy and my fleet of buses? And, and the, the entire idea of the grid emotion offering is really to think not anymore like chargers, because that's not the question. The idea is to think like, what's the solution grid to plug and data to analytics on, on the two dimension. And uh, so with grid emotion fleet, what we have launched is trying to, what we have done is we, we, we kind of, thought about the DC grid instead of an AC one, and all with all the protection that is required, you compact and condense all the charging technology into one place. It's much better for, for, for maintenance, obviously, of your electrical system. And, and this is combined with, of course, all the grid connection elements you want. And then on top of that, you can put, of, of course, the analytics in order to consider your energy and your fleet as a system. So, um, I would say that's in a nutshell the idea, and I believe that if we look at the numbers in terms of amount of buses shown uh, by, by our colleagues on the operation side before, we're going to the thousands, and, and therefore we need to think differently the infrastructure as well. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Yeah, you centered perfectly the topic and the reason of this, uh, of this webinar, so the time of uh, uh, pilots, of small-scale uh, pilots is, is over, now we are going forward large scale fleets and um, 
And this must go along with, with the change in the approach also from the infrastructural uh, side. So uh, Alexander Schabert, uh, VA City, uh, transition to e-mobility is bringing IT capabilities to a crucial uh, role. It has been uh, said also before, Bruno Laperi from Curie said uh, the, the system is made of vehicle infrastructure and IT. Uh, so this is the field where VA City is, uh, is involved as a provider of uh, uh, fleet monitoring tools based on uh, telematics. So please, what should operators consider when going their e-bus uh, fleets? Yeah, thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, indeed, there were a lot of interesting points from the speakers um, that just presented. Um, and one thing is clear, you need IT to effectively manage your electric buses. Now, we already heard about this magic triangle. On the one hand side, you have the vehicles, so you need to focus on vehicle telematics. On the, one hand, on the other hand side, you have the chargers, where you need to focus on uh, the charging station monitoring as well as smart charging. And then you have the existing IT systems, for example, a dispatching system, which plans which vehicle needs to um, be uh, on which block and needs to leave a depot at what type uh, at what time of the day. And that's where it's crucial that these systems play together. And if you think of e-mobility in like two stages, then the first stage is you purchase a couple of vehicles and you make your first experiences. And there usually it's enough just to um, fit a telematic solution on your vehicles, you monitor the state of charge, the remaining range, uh, you focus on the um, distances driven, the efficiencies, so more it's a learning tool at that moment. And the same also if you look at charging stations, um, charging stations, you don't really need it to balance out power if you have three, four buses in the depot. But then it's mostly just understanding what information do you get from charging stations and um, what are the benefits of monitoring them, how many problems, for example, can you solve by remotely resetting them. And then once you go to a larger rollout, and that's what we right now see this transition from first experiences to really full rollout. We heard, um, especially for example, in the Netherlands, the use cases where there are a couple of concessions with more than um, 200 electric buses. Well, not a couple, but now the first one and a couple of more to follow in the next years for sure. And what we see there is other aspects are getting more important. Um, on the vehicle side, operators need to understand the technology much better. And when I talk about the technology, I primarily mean the batteries. This is the most expensive part and also the part uh, that is mostly unknown. You still don't really know if a battery will last for six years, for eight years or for 10 years. So gaining a deep understanding in that, understanding what are the implications, for example, of the day-to-day -day operations, what happens if one of the cell, for example, breaks down, if one of the cell voltages uh, are suddenly um, significantly dropping, uh, your bus will then quickly deplete um, and that will have operational consequences. So you basically really need to focus on that part. You also need to understand uh, what is written in your warranty contract. So for example, a bus manufacturer guarantees you uh, a certain amount of cycles or a certain amount of energy throughput, but only under the conditions that you do not deplete the battery under um, a certain percentage state of charge or um, going, for example, uh, below um, uh, or above a certain temperature. So all these aspects are then really important to consider when you uh, roll out to the second stage of a full fleet rollout. On the charging stations, yeah, if you suddenly have uh, 50, 100 or 200 buses in the yard, um, it is getting more and more important to balance out loads. So to not have all vehicles charging at the same time, but to really distribute the energy to the buses that really need to be uh, charged first and then roll out to the vehicles afterwards. And to achieve that, you need smart IT systems. You need, for example, a yard management system that uh, informs the charge management system, which bus will go out at what time, and also how many kilometers uh, does he need to drive, or what should be the state of charge he should go out with. Uh, for example, in Germany, um, the VDV463, which is specifically an interface for that, has just been developed similarly to a preconditioning interface where you can then precondition uh, the vehicles before they uh, go out on the routes, the VDV261 in that case. And also looking at the vehicle telematics data, you need to utilize that much smarter. Um, on the one hand side, integrating it into your control centers, understanding ranges, understanding state of charges uh, with the people that control the complete traffic. And 
also understand what are energy consumption of specific vehicle types per route. Because again, if you calculate which bus should go out on which block, you need to understand what is the energy consumption on these specific blocks. So in a nutshell, if you go to um, a full rollout, um, key is more vehicle data, understand battery technology, understand battery warranty contracts as well. Second of all, highlighting fully the charging stations and the smart charging. And third of all, making the systems smart by integrating the different IT systems together. Thank you, Alexander. You were talking about so many challenges for the next years. And now we know why the next 10 years won't be boring at all, <laughs> we might say. Uh, the, title, the title of today's webinar mentions the electric depot. So technology is evolving concerning buses, but it must get along with an evolution of depot management. So I would like to ask uh, Michael Proisker from PSI, uh, in this sector, is artificial in intelligence becoming an important actor? And, and why, of course, please. Yes, thank you. Um, you're right, artificial intelligence is becoming more and more important, but as for us, PSI Transcom, Artificial intelligence has, has always been an integral part of our depot management system. And that's since the first DMS projects in 1998. Even back then, when all the buses were powered by diesel engines, we have already used artificial intelligence for refuel optimization. Of course, the complexity of the optimization has increased since around 2018, when the zero emission buses came up in greater numbers. Our current EDMS, so-called for electrical buses and others, is able to handle in parallel all types of energy, such as diesel, natural gas, battery electric, and shortly also hydrogen. In accordance with the specific energy properties, we perform a continuous dynamic vehicle disposition based on an energy forecast for each individual vehicle and on many other criteria. Fortunately, we have an AI specialist inside the PSI group, the PSI Fuzzy Logic and Neurosystems. Their AI-based module, so-called Qualicition, has been an essential part of our DMS since 2010. This Qualicition core was not developed especially for public transport. It is a universal optimization module that is widely used in various industries. For our purpose, we supply the AI module with all relevant data, such as the state of charge of the battery, vehicle attributes, route uh, characteristics, characteristics, and even weather conditions. All in all, more than 80 criteria are taken into account when optimizing the disposition. Um, another use case for artificial intelligence in this context is the so-called multi-criteria charging. This means that not only the energy requirements is um, is important for the charge management, but also the optimization of the battery lifespan. And it was uh, already, uh, mentioned by Alexander Schabert, um, the compliance with the warranty conditions of the vehicle manufacturer. So that is that are the challenges for the next uh, years. We are working on it. Uh, our EDMS visit AI-based optimization is already up and running in many cities. For instance, in Hamburg, shortly also in Berlin with the BBG, we have heard about it, also in Luxembourg and in France. And um, yes, it's an ongoing process. So ongoing and very, very concrete, let's say, and that's, that's, that's good for, for, for all the sector. Uh, now let's talk about energy utility with Valerio Vadakino from NLX. Uh, the question is quite simple in this case. So why and how an energy utility may be a player in supporting the transition to electric buses? Mm, we know mm, quite well NLX activities in Latin America, but which are the company's projects for Europe? Please, Valerio. Thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you to, to having the opportunity to share our experience on that. So first of all, let me say that our experience, I mean, our Latin American projects are uh, uh, pretty well known uh, globally, but actually our first experience 
is uh, um, started in uh, Europe uh, with, uh, with TMB in, uh, in Barcelona uh, in uh, 2013, where we started, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the journey of TMB to electrify their, their fleet. Um, so when you uh, deal with an electrification project, in particular when we are talking about uh, fleet electrification, I mean, you cannot avoid that we involve anyhow an energy utility. Um, uh, so uh, there is uh, often uh, uh, in, the, in the public transport market, uh, in particular, uh, um, in a sort of mistake of deep, uh, an approach that could not uh, provide the, the most benefit of an electrification. So the fact that electrification is usually linked to a pure replacement of a vehicle, but it's not that because you need uh, uh, to design since the beginning uh, uh, all the system from the charging depot, from the uh, potential opportunity charging, the sites of the electric fleet uh, in a proper way in order to um, achieve uh, uh, all the benefits and avoid any kind of troubles in the operation. So in that framework, uh, uh, NLX put together a, a model that we call the bus as a service in which we stay by, side by side with the operator uh, since uh, project design uh, up to um, implementation and the operation of the uh, public fleet electrification. So obviously it's not uh, uh, enough to be an energy utility, to be, uh, I mean, to bring value uh, on the table. Um, it, it, it also counts, I mean, the experience that you have. Uh, we have uh, now reached a, a pretty decent leadership position, uh, being the largest uh, electric bus service provider uh, outside China with uh, uh, management of uh, 1,500 electric bus globally. Um, so why Latin America has been a little bit uh, uh, ahead with the rest of the world? So they have done, first of all, political commitment. So in particular, uh, talking about Chile and Colombia, uh, the governments have uh, uh, set up a specific target, an ambitious target of electrification of their fleet. And they are doing that, issuing a tender uh, specifically for electrification of public transport. And then they have uh, um, set up two specific approach, two specific, uh, I would say, drivers in, uh, in the tenders. So one is a comparison uh, by TCO. So they are putting in uh, um, uh, competition different technologies, including electric, but uh, the competition and the evaluation is based on TCO. Not only, uh, they are not saying, I want to buy the cheapest bus uh, in the market. That is the uh, most common uh, uh, approach that we are seeing in particular in Europe. And so doing that, they are already getting uh, the most effective technologies along lifetime uh, of, the, of the vehicle, the useful lifetime of the vehicle. Then the second approach that's pretty interesting uh, is getting traction also in Europe in some countries is the uh, looking at the market uh, to ask for uh, the so-called as a service model in which private companies uh, can bring not only uh, private companies like us or, or, or similar to, to energy utilities, even infrastructure funds and, uh, and uh, industrial player could bring not only technical capabilities, but also financing. In that case, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they, uh, there is a, a strong reduction in public fund needs. Uh, so there are less uh, money that we need to put uh, uh, in, uh, in, on, on the table to buy buses. And we can rely also on private companies uh, financing in order to uh, create the so-called leverage effect. So with the same amount of money, you can get uh, a larger amount, uh, uh, a larger number of uh, electric bus in the uh, on the streets and the third topics uh, they are getting they are giving premium uh, valuation for zero emission buses uh, in the in the tender so that uh, they are really uh, getting the most effect the most cost effective uh, the most sustainable and uh, highest quality uh, fleet electrification uh, fleet uh, uh, technology 
um, we are seeing a, a lot of EU, uh, EU uh, countries that are moving there. Uh, and based on our uh, estimation, we see that in the next uh, 12, uh, uh, 24 months, we will see, I mean, a dramatic growth in uh, electric bus uh, technologies across, uh, across Europe. Thank you, Valerio. Thank you very much. Also for, for also for mentioning in this event the topic of TCO, which is quite cru crucial, we might say. Uh, now let's welcome uh, bus manufacturer Solaris. Here we have Mateusz Pikasewski. Uh, Solaris was the leader uh, in 2020 of the electric bus market in Europe. As we have highlighted in the introduction, we see a trend in Europe for depot charging. Some manufacturers have developed the models only designed for plug-in charging, while your company is keeping a more, let's say, agnostic, flexible approach, uh, which is the, the background of, of, such, uh, of such decision. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to send my best regards to all of almost 1,000 attendees of this today event. I hope all of you are staying safe and healthy, and, and apart from having this great opportunity to to meet online soon we will have as a bus industry opportunity to meet uh, face to face yeah in the coming uh, exhibitions but okay going back to the to your uh, question i would say that solaris is representing more customer oriented approach uh, which is simply reply to the to the customer to the different customer needs uh, we are in the, that good position as uh, solaris uh, that we are very uh, let's say one we are one of the um, pioneers of this e-mobility uh, market. The first battery bus which we launched was uh, in 2011. And since that time we have delivered and have contracted all, over 1,200 buses which are operating every day in 18 countries uh, in over 100 cities. And already today we are facing the phase of let's say large scale deployment of these e-buses due to the fact that for example, uh, our buses in number of 160 operated uh, in Warsaw, 250 buses in Milano, over 1, 120 buses operated by BBG Berlin. So we already today have experience from the large uh, fleets of e-buses being in operations. And uh, the reason why we have in offer different options of charging, uh, so-called depot charging or opportunity charging, came from the uh, from the fact that there is that as Solaris we believe, and it was already said today by one of the operators, that there is no one solution which uh, fits all require or meets all requirements. Every uh, bus operation, every city has a different, let's say, requirements in terms of of length of of, of routes, timetable, uh, topography, climate. All of these factors, uh, one they are determining also their charging options. So in some cases, we can use the uh, depot charging options, in, in, while in others, the opportunity uh, op, uh, opportunity charging would be the, the most, uh, more efficient option. From our observation, we can say that today, all, uh, almost 70% of operators are um, choosing both, I would say, solutions. So this is the combination, actually, of the, let's say, standard solution, which is plug-in, depot charging, plus additional roof-mounted pantographs. But I would like to also say that uh, opposite to, let's say, approach which you had a few years ago, where uh, there was a simple, I would say, uh, distinction between the plug-in slow depot charging and fast roof-mounted or inverted pantograph fast charging, today we have, uh, we have combination of both. So the type of charging device doesn't stand for the uh, fast or slow uh, charging. Uh, what we are um, observing today uh, that many operators are opting for, let's say, roof-mounted pantographs, but also for, for both, for fast charging and for depot charging. Uh, the, the reason for that is very simple. It's more, I would say, automated solution, which uh, does not require, say, um, engagement of the driver. It's simply the drivers can push on the dashboard uh, one button, which is uh, uh, putting up the pantograph to the charging station, and uh, uh, out, um, it's, the process uh, is, is started. Also, we should uh, uh, take under consideration the fact that uh, we um, could observe the 
huge development of charging technology and devices for these years. And a few years ago, the maximum available power of plug-in chargers were up to 140 kilowatts. And this was strongly related with the homologation and certification process of CCS combo two type connector. While uh, today, uh, the charging power of, let's say, depot chargers uh, is available at power of 300 kilowatts and, and more thanks to the liquid cool uh, solution. Yeah? So uh, as I said at the very beginning, we are presenting customer-oriented approach where we take under consideration many factors uh, and offer the best uh, and the most efficient solution to the final user. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Mateus, also for bringing a couple of reasons to distinguish um, between uh, depot charging and plug-in charging, which is a crucial topic. As Pantoc of charging allow automated and uh, space-saving solutions, as you, as you mentioned. And on the other, on the other hand, uh, uh, the technology of plug-in charging is, of course, uh, improving. So thanks, uh, in the meanwhile, to all the panelists. I think we are keeping very, a very good, a good pace uh, uh, so far. Um, I've been asked if the slides and presentation will be made available uh, later. The answer is yes, they will be published very shortly on uh, sustainablebus.com. So let's go to the second round of the industry session. Let's go back to Itachi ABB Power Grid with uh, Mr. Andre uh, Bourdais. So in an article of yours, you mentioned the, uh, the role of uh, electric mobility hubs uh, in view of future mobility. So Andre, may you outline uh, the meaning of such expression and how should we imagine the, these apps in the framework of public transport systems. We guess the standardization and energy management will be quite uh, crucial in these regards, please. Thank you, thank you for the, the question. So if we come back a little bit to what I said earlier, but also I think share with my colleague here is, as we move towards larger scale, uh, obviously, the energy need and the power capacity is increasing in depot as an, as an example, but we do have also other examples for logistic fleets and other type of things, but we're going to put this aside and focus on the depot here. So today, what we see is, first of all, power rating increasing at the charging point. We were mentioning up to 300 kilowatt in terms of uh, with liquid cool technology, with flash technology, we already do for several years 600 kilowatt. Um, and we, we know already that there are some standards that are under discussion, like MCS, to go to megawatt type of charging for, for a charging point. So obviously, we have an increase of charging capacity. The second thing is we have an increase of the amount of charger we need to operate in a depot because we want full fleet electrification. So what you end up with is that you end up with a depot which is really, in a, in a way, it's like a mini energy hub. You're going, we see projects now quite often, five megawatts, we see 10 megawatts, we even see more. So we start really to go from, at the beginning, when it was low voltage type of connection, just plug a charger, take an electric contractor into a really like medium voltage connection where you're going, you're going to be more efficient, you, you, you take more power from the grid, and then you need another type of electrical integration. So we have a power hub with the depot, with such a kind of power capacity that we see. And at the same time, um, those, the energy that you need to manage is not just, just a constant load. It's actually a very dynamic load, as mentioned also by other uh, peers here. You, know, you want to make sure that you optimize the amount of energy you put into uh, you know, a certain amount of buses depending on your timetable operation and so on. So you have a very dynamic type of load. So now the, the other thing that you, you see is that those depots, they are very often um, not isolated in the nature somewhere. They are within urban communities where there is also a distribution grid. There is the need of energy consumption around, whether it's industries, small industries, SMEs, or also buildings and so on and so forth. So you start to see that there is some sort of energy management that can be made out of those depots. So that's the, the kind of first indication that we are not yet here today but as we increase the power and we increase the energy flow and also the dynamic of those flows, that you could consider those depots also as uh, some whole energy mobility hub. So not only the mobility part, but also the energy part. 
The second aspect that comes, and, and, and again, I think in the market today, we don't see it yet because operator first wants their fleet to, to, to move, but as they grow in size, it will start more and more to be realized. And then we're going to move to such model. We, we can have also PV cells on the top of roof and so on. So there is a lot of energy management behind. The other aspect that we have to consider is as we increase the fleet electrification, we have more and more batteries storing energy in, energy in the vehicle. And then you start to understand that, you know, you may actually full fill the batteries, but you may also use them as somehow uh, an energy for the local communities around. And then you, you start to go into the concept of vehicle to grid, which is still, I would say, nascent at the moment, but technology do exist to, to realize this. So you can have those bilateral flows and you can start to have this energy trading between the mobility sector, the fleets, and also the local communities that, that are around. And finally, I would say and another very important point here, it's not just about the, the beauty of considering what the technology can deliver. It's also a lot related to the financing and business model you can set in. Because obviously, if you are an operator of buses, you may go to the point where either in terms of CapEx, it's going to be very expensive to just buy on a CapEx. It can be also that starting to manage the energy outside of your core competence and fleet would be just too much addition. And it can be also that other stakeholders like DSOs, as an example, developers, they can take over this, this duty of managing the energy for the fleet operator. So the fleet operator uh, can focus on the core competencies on managing the fleet with all the digital that comes. So then you end up thinking that there are different type of business model that can exist, such as not necessarily buying on a CapEx, but on an OPEX model, on the rate-based type of model, where you're going to have a trade between an investor, an asset operator on the energy side on the depot and the fleet operator, and they will trade energy and therefore value together uh, constantly. So, so that, that this kind of new type of business model you can have also to, to accelerate the transition uh, with the, um, the, the, the right uh, financial. So we go also on X as a service type of, of solution. So if I really summarize in a nutshell, I believe today we have done phase one, it's the pi pilot. Now we are at phase two, like how do I scale up my fleet and my infrastructure? But we already see on the horizon the phase three, which is how do I actually use the infrastructure I have to maximize, let's say, the value I can get out of it not only from a fleet operation perspective, but also from an energy trade perspective and from a business model and, 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 and different stakeholders perspective. So that's really the concept around those energy mobility hub that, that are composed of course of those uh, various elements. Thank you, thank you, Andre. Yeah, we are learning that transition into eBus is bringing really the number of actors of uh, stakeholder involved to, to grow, we name utilities, we name providers of, of infrastructures. So dialogue and partnering become really paramount as well as you mentioned, innovative business uh, uh, scheme. Very uh, seated, Alexander Schaber, we go back uh, to uh, the topics of uh, uh, IT, of telematics. So the data gathered by uh, your company, by Very City, can offer a quite important, interesting uh, observatory deck for eBus uh, performances. So from what you have seen from uh, the, uh, the market, can you be more specific about how this data may be uh, used by PTO? I refer, for instance, to uh, the possibility of predicting which are the, the impact of weather or topography on the, on the, on the EBOS millage, as well as the driver behavior, and also to the uh, consequences in the area of uh, uh, maintenance. Please, uh, Alexander. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, I would like to highlight here three key aspects. So the first is um, you, uh, your question was pointed towards energy consumption based on different routes, also based on different influencing factors. Um, one of the core technologies we've developed in-house is a driver behavior monitoring tool. So with this, we give uh, drivers help to a better transition towards mobility. And why is that so re relevant? Because if you think of diesel buses, it's mostly about savings. You just brake, you lose all the energy because of the braking, um, it dissipates to heat, and then uh, you have a higher energy consumption in terms of um, the diesel consumption or the diesel output. 
But if you look at uh, e-mobility, it's not so much about the costs, it's more about the range that a driver can drive. And if you hear again, take the example of braking, you can brake in two different ways. You can um, just brake by regenerative braking, by just rolling out, regaining a lot of the energy, or you could brake by using the brake pads and then have the same problem as with the diesel vehicles, um, create a lot of heat. Um, we see that drivers that are well educated compared to drivers that are not so well educated driving an electric bus and especially using the regenerative braking functionality can differ um, up to 30%. And if you think of 30% energy impact, that directly means for the operations that you have 30% more or less range. And especially looking right now at the battery capacities that are out there and the I would say in certain situations, very limiting ranges, uh, it is really crucial to educate the drivers properly to at least get the maximum range out of it and reduce the driver influence as much as possible. Now, the second aspect in that point is the energy consumption during cold or warmer days, uh, especially if it gets very cold, let's say minus 10, minus 20 degrees Celsius, and you want to heat fully electrically, then um, your energy consumption can take up to 50% of the total energy consumption of the bus. And if you consider this with already a very um, low, um, let's say a, a driver efficiency, then your range decreases even more during winter time. So these are really two important aspects when it comes to um, uh, energy management um, and bus operations that need to be taken into account. The second aspect I want to highlight when it comes to um, some, uh, some learnings we've received is really focusing on this battery data. Right now, if you get a battery warranty contract from, for example, a bus manufacturer, you usually pay about nine to 10 cents per kilometer for this warranty. And what we see nowadays is that, uh, especially now during the rollout to larger bus fleets, uh, especially um, larger bus operators are more and more taking the risk because they see that the batteries are most likely lasting longer than initially projected. So instead of taking this warranty, um, a battery warranty for nine to 10 cents a kilometer, they focus more on IT solutions where you monitor the battery and all the important parameters to that. Um, we, for example, also here have a partnership with TWICE where we forecast battery health and remaining lifetime. And comparing here the costs, it's less than a cent per kilometer. So you have a savings potential here of up to 90% just on the operating costs. Sure, at one point you need to replace the battery, but it is getting more and more predictable if it's going to be after six years, eight years, or perhaps even after 10 or 12 years. And the third point I wanted to highlight, especially here also talking about the topic of the electric depot, the smart charging. Smart charging plays um, a crucial role and that is uh, saving a lot of costs looking at what we've seen at uh, some of our clients. Um, the cost savings vary hugely between uh, different countries due to different energy regulations, but um, basically you can split the cost savings into three aspects. First of all, if you apply a smart software and therefore reduce the peak load, you um, can work with less investment costs because instead of four transformers, perhaps two or three are sufficient. That already saves a lot of money. The second cost that you can really save are operating costs. And that is split by peak demand costs, meaning if you reduce your peak demands, you can also significantly save costs. And the second part, is in some parts of the world, in some countries, you have uh, varying um, energy prices during day or nighttime tariffs. So also, if you take this into account, there's a huge potential of savings. A couple of operators where we've worked with, we were able to achieve up to 40% operational savings on the charging side by applying smart charging algorithms. And that again, helps a lot with bringing uh, the total cost of ownership down and therefore making sure that the electric buses have even earlier break even than their diesel counterparts. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander. Let's stay focused on future application with the Martin Prince at PSI. Uh, the use of green energy is a must to reach when uh, um, we are targeting a real reduction in carbon uh, emissions. And uh, as electric fleets grows, uh, 
we know several depots must be uh, managed uh, together. So Martin, may you outline uh, future challenges and uh, uh, a view on the future of energy management within uh, bus uh, depots, please. Yes, as uh, thank you for having me here. Yes, as already mentioned by Hitachi and also by Viri City, um, we believe that uh, bus fleet operators will become operators of huge distributed electrical system that needs to be monitored and controlled. In the near future, uh, this infrastructure will not only include the charging system and charging infrastructure transformers and the associated sub distribution in the local depot power grids but also energy so storage, as already mentioned, for example, second life batteries, um, power generation locally, um, um, photovoltaic power plants, which are used on the rooftops, and also um, other local power producers and consumers, which has to be integrated and seen as a whole energy system inside the depots. Therefore, the task is um, to efficiently monitor the entire electrical system and to optimize its overall usage. Um, due to the required uh, specialization of employees and for the reasons of efficiency, it makes sense uh, to centralize these tasks and to use the proven control center system that um, have been used uh, for decades to monitor electricity grids um, as a technology basis for charging management systems. And in addition, it will become economically profitable for bus fleet operators in the future if fluctuations in the public power grid are compensated um, by grid-friendly behavior of the charging operation, which already mentioned um, in the session before. And um, the PSE smart charging system therefore already offers um, the possibility of limiting grid connection power and thus preventing peak loads through peak shaving by distributing charging processes over time. And in addition, the system already supports some kind of grid-friendly load management by dynamically limiting the grid connection power of depots. In current projects, for example, in Luxembourg, we are already using this kind of technology to optimize charging operation based on constantly updated list of limits of the available grid connection power to comply with grid connection conditions um, of the electrical grid operator. Um, thus, bus fleet operators um, uh, integrate this technology um, and they can benefit from it by huge savings. And also, of course, they support the energy transition and thus also the overall goal of a CO2 reduction. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So we are approaching the end of the industry session. We have a couple more speeches before, before the end of this session and before, of course, the conclusions. Uh, so back to Valerio Vadacchino, NLX. Uh, let's talk about grid capacity because it is a major concern when dealing with the transition of fleets to electric drives. The optimization of charging by means of digital tools is a much discussed issue as the issue of generating additional revenue for the operator as well. Is this a matter of debate or are there case studies already on the subjects, perhaps outside Europe? What would it take to implement such models also in Europe? Please, Valerio. Thank, thank, thanks for the, for the question. So we, we have also listened from the, the previous uh, speech, the, uh, the colleague from industries, uh, I mean, the challenges that, uh, uh, providing the right size so the right connection to the grid, uh, the right power uh, uh, for uh, fleet electrification uh, um, uh, implies. So this is actually the uh, main reason why energy utility are involved in that and the energy involved in, is involved on in that. We started uh, uh, investing in uh, um, hardware and software uh, to manage uh, electric vehicle uh, uh, charging processes since uh, early 2000, because we wanted to foster and to support uh, the uh, spread of electric mobility. Uh, at the same time, we wanted to um, uh, be sure that uh, once the number of electric vehicles uh, uh, across our streets uh, would have been uh, uh, relevant, uh, 
we couldn't have any kind of impact on our distribution grid and so uh, the energy supply to residential uh, industries and all the um, uh, users. So for this reason, uh, as you said, the uh, digital platform to control uh, uh, charging processes is crucial. In particular, if you think about uh, what happens for uh, public transportation electrification, because you, you would have a lot of power needs concentrated in some hub, in particular when we talk about depot charging. So just to give you some numbers, if you think about slow charging, so a 60 up to 80 kW uh, power charger to uh, recharge uh, one bus, it means that more or less to recharge one, one bus, you need the power uh, that uh, uh, provide electricity and power for more or less uh, 10 up to 20 residential apartments. So basically a building. If you think about uh, 100 uh, electric bus at the, at the depot, uh, basically you need to power uh, uh, a new neighborhood. So it's pretty tough. And then uh, you think uh, uh, if you, on top of that, you think that depot are uh, usually within uh, uh, urban areas where uh, electricity grid is already, is already stressed. Uh, I mean, it could be a blocking, I would say, uh, issue for, for electrification. So uh, smart, uh, applying smart charging uh, uh, um, algorithms uh, and logics, uh, as also Alexander from BCD uh, uh, pointed out, uh, basically brings uh, several benefits. So the most uh, um, uh, say important one is uh, at the beginning of the project, of an electrification project. And just to give you an example, first phase of our project in Santiago de Chile, 100 buses we needed uh, uh, with the dummy uh, charging uh, uh, logics, we needed uh, basically eight megawatt uh, of power capacity at the depot. Applying uh, our digital small uh, charging uh, platform, we have been able to ask uh, and to connect to the grid uh, half of that, so four mega. A, a, a huge impact in terms of feasibility of the project, in terms of uh, investment, initial investment. Then it doesn't end here because, uh, uh, again, thanks to the smart charging logic, so power demand management uh, and also time of use management, uh, the public transport operator over there, so our customer. Uh, has been able to save 50% uh, uh, of the electricity bill uh, in their operating, uh, uh, basically, uh, cost. Um, now we are also improving our platform, integrating uh, uh, the, the platform with the off-the-shelf scheduling system so that we can uh, estimate to have uh, uh, even a boost in the saving for the PTOs of around 20%. So 70% of savings in the energy bill is huge. Then you mentioned uh, very uh, um, correctly the potential of uh, using and monetize uh, these assets in the energy markets. Um, so battery and the bus at the end of the day are batteries with, uh, with wheels. Uh, so one, uh, once they are, when they are seated uh, at parked at the depot and connected to the charging infrastructure, basically they are very valuable resources for the electricity grid. Um, so leveraging on uh, flexibility market, uh, flexibility capacity markets that in many parts of the world, many countries of the world are already there, um, you can also monetize these assets in order to create additional revenue stream. Example, in the United States, we are providing school districts with electric school uh, buses. On top of that, we are also leveraging on our uh, leadership in uh, demand response uh, uh, flexibility capacity uh, in order to enroll these assets into the demand response market over there. Uh, and uh, this kind of uh, new uh, revenue stream uh, is uh, basically covering 15% uh, of the uh, operational expenditure for the operator. So it means a huge saving on top of the savings that electrification brings. Uh, so what, the, what, what, what means in, 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 EU, in uh, EU to do that? Some countries already have flexibility market available. Uh, not all the markets uh, have uh, or gives to the um, electric vehicle the opportunity to enroll in the flexibility market. So those two basically market and regulatory 
uh, framework uh, topics uh, are the key topics I mean to have also this uh, um, uh, value added uh, uh, in uh, fleet electrification processes. Thank you, Valerio. Thank you. So very smart energy management, let's say, uh, as well as energy transition. These are key topics indeed, and we have been talking a lot about this today. So let's refer once again to uh, energy transition. Uh, Mateus from, from Solaris, uh, energy transition has impacted the organization of your group as a bus manufacturer. I refer to skills, competencies, relation to PTOs and suppliers. With the transition to new, to new technologies, most of the operators are looking for partners, more than just providers. What can you say about this, please? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have the impression, and as I was informed by a few colleagues who observing this webinar, I think part of my previous answer was, was cut. It. So if, uh, if you don't mind, I would just add my, uh, my previous um, statement uh, regarding the, the, let's say, preferred types uh, by different operators of batteries and charging options. I would just add that due to the, the, the fact that we believe that there is no one solution which fits all requirements, we are offering different types of charging options, different types of batteries, and actually both technologies are very strongly uh, related uh, uh, each other. And I will fluently, and so that's why we offer different options, and fluently I will uh, answer your question, switch to your question right now. Because and, and this approach requires new skills and new uh, new capabilities of the of our teams uh, in terms of production, after sales, maintenance, uh, and and servicing our um, electric bus fleets uh, in operation. So uh, today we are offering we are all, not only the OEM of the vehicle itself, but we are also uh, offering the full uh, entire package of e mobility solutions. So we go with a potential customer through the entire process, first of feasibility study, collecting the best possible option uh, in terms of types of batteries, charging. Uh, this is of course related with the type of vehicle, passenger capacity. <clears throat> so we take under consideration a lot of different factors. Then we delivered uh, vehicle itself, but also very often with infrastructure, with the entire turnkey solutions uh, regarding infrastructure. And later on, we need to provide to the operators for many, many years, maintenance and after sales services, which require the special skills, uh, talking about battery buses. So uh, only in last three years, from the product mix perspective, uh, we see the huge transition or transformation, which has been uh, done, just to give you the few facts, in 2018, uh, almost 29% of our entire production were uh, alternative drives vehicles. By alternative drives, I mean battery buses, trolley buses, and hybrid buses, when last year, uh, already 44% of our production mix were electric or partially electric-driven vehicles. This, uh, so this requires changes in our production teams and new skills. So in practice, we need more mechatronics instead of mechanics or electricians. Yeah, this, this also means change for our after sales teams. And this also means the development of new products and services. By products, I mean, for example, our new remote uh, diagnosis and maintenance tool, which is ES Connect uh, software uh, developed especially for battery buses where we can mon monitor remotely uh, our battery bus fleets, we can diagnose them remotely. And in the future, we will be able to uh, develop also the predictive maintenance um, functions, which I think are very important for uh, operators operating large uh, fleets of battery buses. Uh, in terms of new products developed for our customers, products and services, I mean, specially dedicated teams for infrastructure, because today we are not only manufacturer of, of uh, vehicle itself, but as I said, we are also responsible very often in many tenders, in many contracts to deliver uh, turnkey solutions, uh, including infrastructure. So we need to develop the special teams dedicated uh, to provide these new, from our perspective, uh, services. So this is the, the um, challenges which are facing today in a mobility market.
Thank you, Matthias. Next 10 years won't be boring for you as well as for Bewitch Berlin. And um, apologies, um, we are quite surprised you said we, we cut you before. Really, it was no intention to do so. <laughs> apologies. I didn't get um, it. <laughs> so far, we've been discussing uh, quite a broad series of, uh, of topics, so charging strategies and deputy management, the role of grid connection, the important part of IT, how uh, also manufacturers' missions and duties have changed during the, the transition. I, um, I remember a takeaway from Bruno Laperi uh, contribution. So reduce, uh, reduce the flexibility of the systems call for more flexibility for the actors involved. So uh, drivers, operators, uh, um, staff, stakeholders. So uh, I guess it's really a, a further reason why knowledge dissemination and uh, discussions between the stakeholders are paramount in this uh, moment. And I must say, uh, with Sustainable Bus are quite uh, are really happy to give our contribution today with a maximum of 950 people connected, so almost uh, nearly 1,000. I would say that uh, with social distancing measures in uh, in force, a conference hall would not have been uh, enough. So thank you again to all of you. Um, talking about knowledge and dissemination, a, a real value for our webinar is the participation of uh, WTP's representative Aida Abdullah, who in uh, in, in WTP covers the position of a senior man manager, knowledge and innovation. So Aida, we are so glad to have you on board with us and glad to hear the conclusions you may draw from the sessions, please. Thank you so much, uh, Ricardo. Uh, it is indeed quite a, a, a challenging task right now to be able to to uh, yeah, summarize in, in the wrap up uh, such a rich uh, and, uh, and uh, extremely in-depth uh, discussion. So I, I have to say I have uh, enjoyed a lot. Actually, I, I feel that two hours is not enough for the topic, but uh, I thank you so much, Ricardo and Sustainable Buses at the same time to the whole uh, lineup in the panel because it's uh, an amazing, um, program and the experts have, uh, have mentioned already anything that is, is relevant for the topic. So uh, I will try to go uh, ahead with the challenge. Uh, I assume you see my screen. I was uh, just putting some notes uh, while, uh, while we were discussing just to facilitate the wrap up. Um, perhaps um, too strong with, uh, with the acknowledge uh, to, to our cities, to European cities, which are being the, the pioneers in this, uh, in this transition, in the, in the energy transition. So uh, basically what we see here is that there is a very strong will and leadership uh, by cities. We have seen the example of Berlin, but there is also example of Hamburg, Groningen, uh, Drenthe, Amsterdam, Eindhoven, many other cities all around uh, Europe uh, that are really uh, pushing uh, very, very strongly towards the electrification, we see that these energy transition plans, they are uh, targeting 2025 or 2030 for, uh, for the full electrification even. And we have the example of how- Aida, Aida, apologies for interrupting you. I, I, I think you mentioned that we should see your screen, but we are not yeah. seeing it. You are not seeing it. Okay, no, no, so no, just no. give me, yes, now. Perfect, uh, okay. Apologies. I forgot to click the share, so the final, the final. Okay, so now you, you are, you are seeing it. Now I see your thoughts. Uh, I was just mentioning that Hamburg indeed uh, even uh, is going beyond uh, the uh, the current policy framework set uh, um, targets set up by the Clean Vehicle Directive. So, for instance, Hamburg took the decision already of not uh, purchasing any diesel uh, bus uh, from 2020. So in this case, uh, it's just, uh, I think it's, it's, it's fair to make uh, a big acknowledge uh, to the cities uh, and, uh, and make, um, and make uh, clear that the drivers that uh, are uh, making this transition possible are backed up totally by, by these pioneering cities. Uh, and they are based on, on, on fighting climate change, of course, climate change, uh, climate protection but also improved air quality and reduce noise and vibrations, no? uh, in increasing the comfort and the innovation of the, of the uh, public transport services. Second key message, uh, I think uh, we can, uh, it's, it's never too late or it's never enough to repeat that. Uh, we are talking when, uh, when, we, when we go for bus electrification, we do talk about a system approach uh, 
versus a vehicle approach, which was the traditional, the traditional view, the traditional optic. And of course, there is many elements that uh, now play a role and are necessary to integrate from the very beginning if we are to ensure that the uh, fleet upscale exercise is, uh, is successful. So we have talked about standardization and interoperability of high power fast charging. This is one of the topics uh, of the Assured project, which I will uh, show you uh, later on. We have talked about smart IT tools for uh, telematic uh, remediation of uh, and diagnosis, uh, of course, for optimized fleet operation. But of course, we also have talked about the need of integrating these uh, these IT uh, IT smart tools uh, into the whole uh, system, no, and combine it with the charging infrastructure, of course, and make it uh, and make it uh, work uh, all together. Also, we do have uh, smart charging strategies and energy storage systems. Basically, this uh, has been very well developed and and uh, and explained by by our colleagues from uh, from uh, ABB and BDCT, but also our colleagues from Enel, I would say uh, this is basically the, the key elements of, uh, of a successful fleet scale, but not only because, of course, uh, we have also mentioned that bus electrification uh, relies on the strong uh, cooperation and, uh, and the buildup of, uh, of very solid partnerships among all stakeholders. And as I said before, so today's a great program has lined up uh, the main uh, the main players in this field. We have uh, talked with uh, with operators. Uh, we have also the industry on board. I think the role of the energy utilities, uh, which is uh, now uh, gaining more importance, is of course uh, also very relevant. Uh, another key message would be uh, that the challenges uh, faced uh, by operators today, when I mean uh, operators, is of course the bus sector, not the European bus sector as a whole, amidst the current pandemic. So we have to deal with uh, reduced riderships, uh, which of course impact on the revenues, and of course we will have an impact, if not yet, uh, on the plans for fleet renewal. We have also mentioned financing and funding. No, how does this fleet renewal exercise take place? So these are all questions that will need to be um, addressed in a, in a proper way. Uh, also, Bruno was mentioning uh, in, a, in in a, in a very in a very legitimate uh, statement that there is a need of finding uh, suitable uh, funding and financing mechanisms. And here, I think that the cooperation and the uh, very close uh, collaboration of PTAs and PTOs can can definitely help to address this uh, this aspect. Uh, perhaps just to mention here, uh, you might know, but uh, there is a there is a quite uh, interesting and helpful document that UITP uh, published, um, and the last edition was uh, published last year. Is the UITP tender structure document? So I invite you to have a look at it uh, because it uh, it underlines the main aspects to take into account also when it comes to the uh, uh, tendering processes of electric buses. Uh, another message uh, is uh, has been also also mentioned, of course, is the need of engaging staff and end users, uh, meaning the passengers, not with the electric buses, as an opportunity also to revamp the image of the urban bus. This is not only uh, a need when it comes to your own staff, meaning uh, introducing new skills, new trainings for your staff. Of course, you make you need to engage your 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 staff in order to if I may say it like this, to love, uh, to love uh, the electric bus. So that you can make sure that the implication is there. It's the same for, for the end users. At the end, we are doing all this transition, not only because uh, there is a policy framework requiring this and there is an, a climate change going on. And at the end, we also do this because we want, we want our passengers to, to have an excellent service, to feel more comfortable when they ride, and this is part of the uh, of the magic of electric buses. No, you can see that this, this is a really a great opportunity to improve the image of the bus because it brings innovation and this touch of modernness to the, uh, very close to the citizen. So you need you need you need you really need to market it in the right way and make uh, your your end users a part of the whole strategy when it comes to the operation of your fleet. At the same time, this is going to be a fantastic opportunity to gain back passengers' trust, no? which, of course, during this pandemic uh, and the several messages launched, uh, 
it's, it's of course uh, creating uh, some uncertainty and some uh, some uh, let's say some hurdles no when it comes to to again go back to the buses go back to the to the life that we had before with public transport no um i would like to mention also how different uh, research and innovation projects have uh, contributed uh, hugely to increase not just the knowledge but even the state of the arts when it comes to electric buses uh, in this case, uh, the Assured project uh, was mentioned by Tangia at the beginning, no? how important uh, standardization and interoperability is when it comes to run uh, successfully electric fleets. Uh, well, in Assured, we have already delivered a set of standards and use case protocols for electric bus charging. And with this, uh, with this uh, publication, we are able to verify interoperability. This plain said, uh, it's increasing amazingly the flexibility of the operation for, for operators because you can uh, mix and match. This, this means, of course, that you can put different vehicles and different chargers of different brands and they work together because they speak the same language. This uh, always, uh, yeah, serving that you are using the same charging technology. We have mentioned here uh, CCS2 uh, with Wax. We have mentioned also Pantograph uh, infrastructure mounted, but vehicle um, they, uh, roof uh, mounted so it's different technologies that we have available now in the market so uh, thanks to this uh, assured 1.0 interoperability protocol you can see the link here uh, you can indeed uh, make sure that the uh, different charging solutions that you might uh, you might decide to apply can work with different with different buses uh, and finally uh, we'll extend myself just a bit uh, to conclude with the last uh, message, which is there is a lot of knowledge, there is a lot of experts, uh, there is already very encouraging and inspiring examples of uh, very successful uh, uh, e-bus fleets around Europe, not just around Europe. Of course, we saw, we saw at the beginning with the presentation from Ruben that there is also very promising uh, developments uh, uh, outside Europe and not just in China, no? so we will see this in the next years. But I would like to talk briefly uh, about the European Commission Flimbus Europe platform, which is uh, exactly um, this uh, the, the tool that is enabling us to go really farther in the upscale, meaning bringing together all the stakeholders in the field of uh, Flimbus deployment, so that we make sure that all the cities uh, that are interested and are willing to follow the example of these uh, very uh, pioneering cities that we have seen before uh, can share with them the knowledge, the expertise, and make it uh, and make it for them uh, even more uh, more uh, even easier to share. Uh, sorry, to deploy uh, their systems. Here you can see it's just a screenshot of the current uh, uh, the current composition of the platform. You see different dots in different colors. Uh, the yellow, uh, the yellow ones are the uh, the follower cities, which means they are part of the platform and are learning with the target cities, which are the green ones, and you will see uh, the blue ones, which are the uh, host cities, meaning uh, more experienced cities, which are let's say taking by uh, taking their experience and and helping the the, the target cities to learn about uh, clean bus technologies. I mentioned already the word enabler. So we do need, no, we do need uh, the artifacts uh, of, of the change. We need, we, we need the support in the, in the transition. So uh, this, uh, the, the, the main stars of the platform are of course the cities, the authorities and the operators uh, who are in need of learning about clean, clean technologies. But we also have in the platform the, the industry, we do have the mass manufacturers, the charging and refueling solution suppliers, we do have the funding and financing institutions, and many more other stakeholders related to clean bus deployment. So analogous to what we were saying before, the platform is, collect, is gathering, not putting together all, uh, all the actors necessary for this. And what does the, uh, the platform do? So basically, the platform has a dedicated, a dedicated work plan, which covers knowledge and expertise exchange, but also uh, provides technical support, meaning along the whole process of, uh, of clean bus deployment, and also brings together the industry and the funding institutions 
so to say, making possible that there is a, there is a, there is a possibility to match no, the supply and the demand side. Uh, just to mention also the technologies that we consider in the platform, we do have, of course, battery electric buses, which is the purpose of this webinar today. We also have plug-in hybrids, but also hydrogen, natural gas, emulsion charging trolley buses. And that's my last slide. I was uh, just hoping to be able to mention that uh, we do have a website, which uh, also includes a clean bus toolkit section where sustainable bus is our uh, co contributor and, and great cooperator. Uh, and you can find there two different sections. We do have the market monitoring, which provides you with uh, data about the European bus market in terms of tenders, orders, uh, and buses in service. So thanks a lot to Sustainable Bus for being here, our main source of, uh, of uh, reliable information. And we do have also the library section, which offers interactive tools for planning. Uh, any webinar that we have uh, been uh, developing in, in the frame of the platform or uh, a public webinar that can be of interest of, uh, of the city. We also will have different activities uh, reported through the, uh, through the uh, website. And of course, I mentioned that uh, before, but the interaction with the industry and the funding uh, and financing entities will uh, happen through uh, marketplaces, no? where, where these actors will be able to present their applications to the cities that need to learn, okay, what is available in the market right there, which is this vehicle, which is this charger, how does it work, how can I no? get a, a full picture of it in order to decide my charging strategy or the size of my fleet, et cetera. Um, this, uh, this uh, section is uh, really intended uh, to be uh, understood or to be, uh, to be known as the place to go when you need to learn about uh, clean bus deployment in Europe. And I invite everyone to have a look at this. And if you believe you can contribute, you are happy to contribute uh, to, this, uh, to this initiative, uh, I just invite you to uh, contact me I will be happy to discuss with you how we can cooperate in the frame of this platform and bring uh, clean bus deployment really uh, much more farther, although it's already uh, an unstoppable movement. So the electrification and the transition to, to uh, cleaner energies is there. So we just need to, to further support it, but we are on the very good way. And with that, uh, that will be it from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aida. Very informative overview. And needless uh, to say, we are uh, very nice to cooperate with the WTP on the Clean Bus Europe uh, project platform. So get to the conclusion of our uh, webinars, a few very practical information. So the video will be available uh, shortly. Aida, please, uh, I think you should uh, stop the, the screen sharing. Yes. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, um, very practical uh, information. The video will be available uh, uh, very shortly on sustainablebus.com. Also, the presentation will be uh, available on the same uh, website. And uh, of course, we invite you to uh, keep following us on sustainablebus.com and be tuned on our next event that will be in October and we'll be focusing on uh, fuel cell uh, buses. Uh, thank you very much for, to all the panelists. Thank you very much to our partners. Thank you to uh, who are attending. Thank you to Fabrizio who was with me uh, today. And uh, thank I would you, Ricardo. Thank you. <laughs>